you ready? Yeah, that's right. The uh, Information Policy Census and National Archives Subcommittee uh, will now come to order. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's hearing entitled Census Data and Its Use in Federal Formula uh, Funding. Today's hearing will examine the impact of using census data on local recipients uh, in, in uh, federal funding allocation decisions. Uh, on our first panel, we will hear from federal department witnesses who will testify about how select federal government agencies use census data in their funding formulas. Our second panel is comprised of local government officials and private agencies who will, who will tell us about their knowledge uh, and experience with census data and their recommendations to improve the use of census data and federal formula funding. Uh, without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make open opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. And I'll, I'll begin with the opening statement. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine how census data is used in federal funding program calculations and whether these federal funding formulas fairly distribute federal monies to state, cities, and local governments. Uh, we will consider many important issues today, including what criteria are used in these federal funding formulas, whether Congress and agencies factor in the undercount of certain communities in these calculations and what steps Congress and the administration can take to improve census data and the present formulas. Census data is used by over 180 federal programs in determining funding levels to cities, counties, and states. These federal allocations to local governments and states topped over $375 billion in 2007 alone. Federal programs that use census data in their funding formulas include Title I education appropriations, Medicaid, and community development block grants. This subcommittee is concerned about HUD's community development block grant program in particular, especially with regard to recent developments in Toledo, Ohio. In 2008, the mayor of T Toledo challenged census estimates and successfully added over 20,000 city residents uh, to Toledo's population. However, with this increase in population, Toledo lost over $290,000 uh, in community development block grant funding. It is counterintuitive for HUD to provide Toledo with less federal funding because the Census Bureau increased the city's undercounted population numbers. Other federal funding formulas such as Medicaid redistribute hundreds of millions of dollars among states uh, with census undercount data, uh, when census undercount data is corrected. Uh, federal funding formulas like Medicaid and community development block grants are sensitive to the undercount, which causes federal funds to be misallocated to cities and states, hurting traditionally undercounted populations, such as low-income children and immigrant communities. A census data is used for a big majority of all federal funding formulas. There needs to be clarity and transparency uh, as to how census data is used and if these federal funding formulas truly serve their targeted communities. Today's hearing will address these issues and reveal existing problems, solutions, and what further research needs to be done with census data and its use in federal funding formulas. Let me thank all of our witnesses for appearing today, and I look forward to their testimonies. I now yield to the distinguished ranking minority member, uh, Mr. McHenry of North Carolina, 
uh, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you for holding today's hearing. Um, and as the chairman already stated, I want to begin by thanking again Mr. Metzenborg and Mr. Uh, Goldenkoff for reappearing before the committee. It's good to have you back. And for the other witnesses, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to testify and being here today. As the chairman has already stated, the data collected by the Census Bureau is vitally important to the calculation of funding levels and appropriations in federal programs. Uh, at the congressional level and by federal agencies themselves. Data is also used by state and local governments to allocate resources and services and by the private sector to determine where to invest and develop industry. The, uh, the subject of today's hearing underscores the importance, the importance of filling out the decennial census form when it, when it arrives on April 1st of 2010. It's vitally important that the American people and everyone in this country respond to that form. It's not a partisan issue. It's simply a matter of uh, having an accurate picture of who is in this country uh, on Census Day 2010. This is very important since uh, it's a very uh, core constitutional principle that we have an accurate count of who is here in this country. And with having a short form only census, it makes it even easier for the American people to participate. So. Members of Congress should advocate for participation, and everyone within government should advocate for participation. And we're grateful for community groups being involved to ensure that people participate as well. I'd also like to uh, thank the chairman for having this hearing today. We last met in March. Um, and I know that we've wrapped up address canvassing, as Mr. Metzenborg has relayed to the Congress. And from the accounts we've gotten, it's uh, gone very well. And we're very grateful for that. And that address canvassing, as Mr. Metzenberg has previously said, is, is a cornerstone to the 2010 census. And I hope that uh, uh, we could have Mr. Metzenberg or uh, the new director, whenever the Senate gets around to, um, well, being the Senate, I guess uh, the, whenever the Senate determines that they'll actually act, that we can actually get the new director in. Um, but uh, approximately 140,000 census workers took to America's streets this spring to verify addresses and assemble the Bureau's list of where decennial forms will be sent and, if needed, uh, enumerators will visit in 2010. On separate occasions, Chairman Clay have I, and I have stated that we both have unanswered questions about this vast canvassing e effort. The outcome of the decennial census depends largely on this step in the operation, and there's an obvious need to review and assess its successes and failures. Uh, and certainly the GAO and the Census Bureau uh, would be uh, would love to have you back. And Mr. Chairman, I, I would certainly uh, think we both learn a lot from that hearing. It's my hope that we can uh, bring you back again soon to evaluate this step of the process. That said, today's hearing uh, is an important opportunity for the committee to ensure that the data, the census data, uh, and federal funding formulas are fair, accurate, and effective. Mr. Clay, Chairman Clay, I thank you for bringing this issue to the forefront about the, in the inequities of community development block grant program. I do share your concerns. Um, and uh, as for how census numbers affect uh, the CDBG, uh, I'd like to uh, point out that the funding formula involves many factors that in the 109th Congress, uh, this subcommittee published in a bipartisan report dealing with that fun funding formula. I ask unanimous consent to submit this for the record. Without, a, without objection, the uh, document is submitted into the record. And uh, it's still regarded as a, a proper, uh, a strong roadmap of how to improve the CDBG program by addressing uh, the need uh, as well as uh, uh, ensuring that we have proper numbers. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for having this hearing today. Appreciate your leadership and thank you for your friendship. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. McHenry, and be assured that as soon as the new director is confirmed by the Senate, uh, uh, they will momentarily be before this committee. So, thank you. And I would like to recognize the uh, gentlewoman from California for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you so much for holding uh, today's important hearing examining the role census data plays in the formulas used for distributing federal funds. And I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses about the mythologies behind these formulas and the steps being taken to promote the census and to improve participation and to de decrease the differential undercount. 
to ensure that federal funds are appropriated to the areas in America where they are needed most. Since the establishment of the decennial census in 1790, every census has experienced an undercount. According to the Government Accountability Office, the 2000 census missed an estimated 2% of the U.S. population, a disproportionate number of which were minorities, uh, low-income households, and children. And my district in particular has traditionally been undercounted due to a lack of mutual understanding and engagement with local constituencies. And this undercount is troubling because without accurate population data, it is impossible to ensure that we have a complete view of our nation's demographics and that Americans have proper representation in state and federal government and that federal grants are targeted to where they are needed most. According to the Census Bureau, for the fiscal year 2007, over $400 billion was allocated through federal grants and direct assistance programs based on formulas reliant on data from the 2000 census. And the amount of critical federal funding at stake reinforces the importance of an accurate and comprehensive 2010 census count for local, state, and tribal governments. Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank today's panelists for their cooperation with our proceedings and for your leadership in ensuring that the 2010 census provides the most complete enumeration of our population in America history. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you so much. And I also want to recognize a, a, a visitor, a guest here, uh, who will serve on the panel today, uh, my good friend, uh, Marcy Kapter from Ohio. Thank you for coming today. And if you have any opening statements, you can be recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know that this mic is working, but um, I wanted to uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to sit in our community of Toledo, Ohio. Uh, in the Ninth District, well know the importance of the census and the distribution of uh, the tax dollars that our citizens send here to Washington and then by formula are sent back home. Uh, on the second panel, I'll have the pleasure of introducing our mayor uh, and his team who've traveled very far, uh, Mayor Carlton Finkbeiner. I'd like to recognize him now, 12 a year mayor of our city, the first strong mayor in Toledo's history. We're very proud of him and no one has fought harder for accurate census counts than he has, having been someone who helped to do census when he was a youngster <coughs> and saw what actually happened when people went out into the field. So we look forward to his testimony this afternoon and I thank you very much for the time. You're very welcome and we look forward to your service on this committee today. Uh, and, and without further ado, uh, we will... Uh, um, I want to start by introducing our first panel. Uh, we will first hear from uh, Mr. Thomas Messenbrock, who is currently serving as the acting director of the U.S. Census Bureau. He has more than 36 years of Census Bureau experience and now oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the federal government's perennial preeminent statistical agency. Next, we will hear from Mr. Robert Goldenkopf, a director on the U.S. Government Accountability Office's Strategic Issues Team. Uh, he has over 20 years of program evaluation experience with GAO and is currently responsible for reviewing the 2010 Census and Government-wide Human Capital Reforms. Our third witness is Mr. Todd Richardson, the Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of Policy Development for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, at HUD, he leads a team of staff responsible for analyzing current data and drawing on the results of past research to assist the Secretary with making informed policy decisions. Our next witness is Mr. Donald Moulds, the newly appointed Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, in this capacity, he provides leadership, direction, and management of policy, research, analysis, evaluation, and coordination of department-wide science and data 
policy activities and issues. And our last witness on the first panel, Mr. Stuart uh, Karachki, is the acting commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics uh, in the U.S. Department of Education. His career has been devoted to applying the best scientific methods to bringing information and evidence to bear on improving social programs. Let me thank all of you for appearing today uh, before the subcommittee. Uh, and it is the policy of the, the committee to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I'd like to ask each witness to please stand and raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses uh, answered in the affirmative. Each of you will have five minutes to make an opening statement. Your complete written testimony will be included in the hearing. Um, the yellow light in front of you will indicate that it is time to sum up, and the red light will indicate that your time has expired. When you hear this, that means shut it off. <laughs> I am Mr. M Mr. Messenborg. Uh, you may proceed with your opening statement. Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the role that data produced by the Census Bureau plays in federal funds distribution. I appreciate the subcommittee's attention to this important issue, and I'm pleased to be testifying alongside uh, for the agencies that use our data. This helps make an important distinction. The Census Bureau is not involved in developing, administering, or evaluating the funding formula uh, or the programs that use our data. However, the Census Bureau, through the Decennial Census, the American Community Survey, and our Population Estimates Program, is the producer of many of the data sources used by agencies in their funding formula. Our job is to produce the most accurate and complete data possible. Today, I will focus my testimony on how the Census Bureau produces the three major data sources used for funding formula. The decennial census program includes both the 2010 census and the detailed demographic, social, economic, and housing char characteristics information produced by the American Community Survey. The American Community Survey collects data monthly for population and housing characteristics that previously were collected in the decennial census long form, and of course we publish that data annually. The Population Estimates Program produces population estimates for the nation, for states, counties, cities, and towns on an annual basis. These population estimates update the most recent decennial census counts each year with new information using births, deaths, and net migration information. The population estimates are used in many formulas to allocate funding. They are also used in the production of the final American Community Survey estimates re uh, released to the public. Thus, the quality of the official population estimates and the American Community Survey are inextricably linked to the accuracy of the decennial census. Federal agencies that administer grants and other federal pro, uh, funds allocation programs typically use a mix of decennial census population estimate and information from the American Community Survey. I make this point to stress the importance of the upcoming 2010 census. Our government's division recently analyzed 140 federal grant and direct assistance programs for fiscal 2007 and concluded that over $400 billion are distributed annually using one or more of these Census Bureau data sources. There is no better way to emphasize the importance of the 2010 Census for local, state, and tribal governments than by acknowledging this. In the years between the decennial censuses, the Population Estimates Program of the Census Bureau produces the official population estimates for the United States. They are considered estimates because they are population figures that do not arise directly from a complete count. 
they are determined by using available data, for example, available administrative record data on births and deaths, as well as uh, information uh, from the IRS to track net migration flows. The estimates rely heavily on data from the latest available uh, decennial census, as those census data serve as the basis on which the population estimates are constructed. Again, through the, again, though, the most important contributing factor to a state's estimated population at any given point in time is the count of that state's population in the most recent decennial census. To ensure the population estimates are as accurate as possible, it is important and critical to have an accurate census count upon which the estimates can be built. To that end, we encourage everyone to participate in the 2010 census. In closing, I want to stress that the Census Bureau goal is to produce complete and accurate data that meet the needs of our customers. For federal funds allocation, the single most important contribution the Census Bureau can make is to count everyone, count them once, and count them where they usually reside. This is a daunting challenge, but we are committed to making the 2010 Census the most successful ever. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Massenboy. Uh, Mr. Golden Call. Chairman, Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss the role that population data plays in the allocation of federal funds to state and localities. In my written statement, we reported that in past years, the federal government has annually distributed over $300 billion in federal assistance through grant programs using formulas driven in whole or in part by census population counts. According to a new Census Bureau study, this figure is now over $400 billion for FY 2007. What's more, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act will obligate an estimated additional $161 billion to federal grant programs for fiscal year 2009, including some programs that depend, to some extent, on census population data to determine the amount of federal assistance. As agreed with the subcommittee, my testimony describes, one, how census data are used in the allocation of federal formula grants, uh, grant funds, and two, how the structure of the formulas and other factors can affect those allocations. In particular, I want to stress two key points. First, although population counts play an important role in the distribution of federal funds, other factors, such as the design of the grant formulas, can mitigate the effect that any population changes have on funding levels. And second, because population estimates are important for federal funding allocations, and the decennial census is the foundation for these estimates, an accurate enumeration in 2010, including the reduction in the historic undercount of minority and other populations, as well as a complete count of communities affected by Hurricane Katrina and other natural disasters, is absolutely essential. Federal grants use various sources of population data in their funding formulas. The largest of these is the decennial census, which the Census Bureau conducts every 10 years. The Bureau also estimates the population for the years between censuses, known as post-census estimates. For example, the allocation formula for social services block grants, which help states fund daycare, health, substance abuse, and numerous other programs, uses the most recent post-census population estimates to distribute funds. Another source of population data is the Bureau's American Community Survey, which provides detailed annual data on socioeconomic characteristics for the nation's communities. It's used to allocate federal funds for such programs as the Section 8 Housing Voucher Program, which is aimed at increasing affordable housing choices for very low-income households. A third source is the Current Population Survey, which is conducted by the Census Bureau for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. CPS data are used to allocate funds for programs under the Workforce Investment Act of 1998, which provides workforce development services to employers and workers. Among funding formulas that rely on population data, that degree of reliance varies. On the one hand, the Social Services Block Grant formula allocates funding based on state's population relative to the total U.S. population. On the other hand, some formulas, such as Medicaid, use population plus one or more other variables to determine funding levels. 
as the completeness and accuracy of population data can modestly affect grant funding streams and other applications of census data, the Bureau has used a variety of programs to address possible errors in population counts and estimates. Importantly, however, while accurate population data play an important role in allocating federal assistance, various grant-specific factors can also affect the distribution of federal funds and can mitigate the impact of population changes. For example, some grant programs, including Medicaid, employ floors in order to mitigate the outcome that would result if a particular grant allocation were determined by the funding formula alone. Further, in order to prevent funding losses from a formula change, programs can include hold harmless provisions guaranteeing a level of funding that is based on a prior year's funding. In conclusion, while population data play an important role in allocating federal assistance through grant programs, the design of a grant can also affect funding allocations and in some cases can mitigate or entirely mute the impact of a change in population. Further, shifts in population, inaccuracies in census counts, and methodological problems with population estimates also impact the distribution of federal grant money. Nevertheless, Given the importance of census data as a baseline for post census estimates used for grant programs, as well as for congressional apportionment and redistricting, counting the nation's population once, only once, and in the right location in 2010 will be absolutely critical. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my remarks, and I will be glad to answer any questions that you or other subcommittee members may have. Thank you so much for your testimony, Mr. Goldman. Mr. Richardson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. HUD annually allocates directly or through guided competitions more than $10 billion to cities, counties, states, Indian tribes, and other grantees using several different formulas based on census data. The Community Development Block Grant Program, proposed for fiscal year 2010 to allocate nearly $4.2 billion, allocates the largest share of the dollars. CDBG is a relatively complicated dual formula, with one formula allocating towards communities that have growth and higher poverty, and another formula allocating to communities that generally have old housing and population loss. These formulas rely on five variables from the Census Bureau. From Census 2000 data, persons in poverty, overcrowded households, and housing units built prior to 1940. These variables are fixed, until we integrate American Community Survey in fiscal year 2011. From annual population estimate data, including updated data as a result of challenges, number of persons, and a variable called growth lag. And I'm going to talk a little bit about growth lag because it affects the question that you raised about Toledo. Um, the growth lag variable is used to um, fund communities that have had historically declining populations. And if a community that has historically declining populations does a population challenge that shows that its population is actually larger than we had thought it was, the net result on the CDBG formula, unlike most formulas, is to result in a funding change that would reduce funding under the CDBG program. Um, so that's a little unusual in terms of how formulas operate, but that's been in place since 1977 when the formula was put in place. I want you to explain it in more detail when we get to the questioning period, but go ahead. Absolutely. Um, other programs that allocate funding using the basic CDBG formula are the Emergency Shelter Grant Program and the Guiding Initial Pro Rata Need Allocation for the Continuum of Care Homeless Program Competition. Separate formulas relying on census data, largely sample data from the Census 2000, include the home, Native American Housing Block Grant, Indian CDBG, Section 202, and Section 811 programs. The Housing Trust Fund, created in HERA and proposed by the President to receive $1 billion for fiscal year 2010, would also be allocated to states using special tabulation data on housing needs. In 2010, as you know, the Census Bureau plans to publish the first five-year data products based on American Community Survey data collected in 2005 through 2009. Beginning in fiscal year 2011, HUD plans to use ACS five-year average data in place of the Census 2000 sample data that are used to allocate most of the funding for the programs I just described. Our understanding is that the five-year ACS data will be weighted to the average of the population controls over the five-year period. 
This is a very good thing since it leads to an integration of updated population and updated counts for all of the variables for each formula on an annual basis. That said, the initial move to the ACS data in fiscal year 2011 is very likely to cause some significant changes in allocation amounts for program grantees. Quality of data is only half of the equation in allocation formulas. Quality of the formula is equally important. Because housing and community development needs are not static, it is important to regularly assess whether these formulas need updating so they remain well targeted to the intended needs and treat all grantees fairly. In 2005, HUD published a report that identified some problems with how the CDBG formula targets funds. The 2005 report demonstrates some stark examples of how the CDBG formula is currently not as fair as it could be. It overfunds some less needy places, it underfunds some very needy places, and it allocates very different grant amounts to places with similar needs. The current formula, on average, will target more funds to the most needy communities, but does so much less so than it did when it was developed in the 1970s. There are several problems with the current, current uh, formula, um, including uh, the use of 1940, use of housing built before 1940 as a proxy for population loss, aging infrastructure, and dilapidated housing. While this may have worked in the 1970s, the, uh, over that, since the 1970s, the more distressed communities have torn down that old housing while the less distressed communities have retained it, leading to a shift in dollars from distressed communities to, to less distressed communities. Other variables like poverty are good measures, but they create some anomalies, such as college towns getting large grants because of the large number of students that are counted in poverty, and the growth lag variable, um, which uh, generally targets places with losing population, but there are some well-off communities that have been static in population since 1960 that get some significant grants as well. Um, the other problem is, is that this is a dual formula, and a dual formula creates some anomalies in itself, uh, funding similarly needed com communities at very different amounts. As you are well aware, changing the CDBG formula to correct its targeting problem is politically challenging. If funding is held static or declining, a change in the formula that results in increases in funding for some communities also results in decreases for others. Fiscal year 2010, however, offers a rare opportunity to change the, for, change the CDBG formula without causing a funding decrease for any community relative to the fiscal year 2009 allocations. This is because for fiscal year 2010, President Obama has proposed to fully fund CDBG at $543 million more than the amount funded in 2009. This gives us an opportunity to implement a hold harmless provision. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the topic of how data from the United States Census Bureau are used by the Department of Health and Human Services in the allocation of federal program funds through formula grants. HHS is the United States government's principal agency for protecting the health of all Americans and providing essential human services, especially for those who are least able to help themselves. We administer more than 300 programs covering a wide spectrum of activities and representing almost a quarter of all federal outlays. HHS administers more grant dollars than all other federal agencies combined and awards approximately 60% of the federal government's grant dollars. In physical, fiscal year 2008, HHS awarded nearly $265 billion in grants representing 38% 30, of total departmental spending. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services awarded the largest amount of grant dollars, and the National Institutes of Health awarded the largest number of grants. For most of the formula grants administered by HHS, the grant allocation formula and data elements are specified in statute. Attached to my written statement is a table listing the HHS-sponsored grants that specify the use of data from the Census Bureau in allocating grant funds. I'd like to highlight a few examples of how HHS uses specific census data elements in grant programs. They're representative of a variety of grant programs administered by HHS, as well as the types of census data that are used in calculating grant award amounts in carrying out statutory intent. The first is the Child Care and Development Fund, which is the primary federal program specifically devoted to providing families access to child care and improving the quality of child care. 
Grants are awarded to states through three component funding streams, two of which rely on the use of Census Bureau data in their funding formula. One allocates block grant funding to states using a formula that includes the state's share of the nation's children under five. The other awards funding to eligible states based on their share of the nation's children under age 13. Data for both children's ratios are obtained from the Census Bureau. The Congregate Nutrition Services and Home Delivered Nutrition Services programs provide meals and related nutritional services to older individuals who help them remain independent and in their communities. Grants for Congregate Nutrition Services and Home Delivered Nutrition Services are allocated to states and territories by a formula based on their share of the population age 60 and over using data issued by the Census Bureau. The mission of the Maternal and Child Health Block Grant is to improve the health of mothers, children, and their families by improving access to health care, eliminating health disparities, and improving the quality of health care. Funding for one component of this program is allocated to states in proportion to their population of low-income children relative to the nation's. The formula uses census data. The majority of HHS's grant allocations, however, are not driven by Census Bureau data. For example, over three quarters of mandatory grant funds awarded by HHS are received by states through the Medicaid program. Census data are used by the Bureau of Economic Analysis, but not by HHS, to produce state and national per capita income data, which, are, which then are used in calculating the federal med medical assistance percentage known as FMAP. State spending on covered Medicaid services is matched by the federal government at the FMAP rate. The authorizing statutes that specify funding allocations form, allocation formula for HHS grant programs typically specify the use of either the decennial population figures or the most recent population estimates from the current population survey published by the Census Bureau. The statutory formula do not direct the department to use the census data that have been adjusted for population undercount and HHS does not make any adjustments of its own. In summary, HHS uses a variety of data from the Census Bureau in calculating funding levels for federal grant programs. Of the 300 programs administered and managed by the Department of Health and Human Services, 50 are grant programs, and of them, uh, census data are used to calculate funding levels in 35. Census data are used by HHS in all cases where authorizing legislation dictates its use and the manner in which it is to be used. HHS does not exercise any discretion to adjust fu uh, funding formula. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Mold for your testimony. Mr. Karachki, you recognized for five minutes. Chair Chairman. Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry. Equipment problem and uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the topic of the use of Census Bureau data in the allocation of federal formula funding of the Department of Education's programs. Since the mid-1960s, the National Center for Education Statistics has computed or provided data to other entities uh, within the department to compute federal funding allocations for various department formula grant programs. We prepare the allocation tabulations in a statistical, uh, statistically accurate and apolitical manner. Most allocations for the department's elementary and secondary education programs are based on the latest data for some relevant subset of the population. In 2009, of more than $50 billion that the Department of Education is spending on elementary and secondary education, approximately 80% is being allocated based on census calculations of population subgroups. Let me provide examples. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, Title I grants to local education agencies, is the single largest federal elementary and secondary education program. For fiscal year 2009, Congress provided $24.5 billion for this program. From its inception, Title I's formula has been based primarily on the number of children ages 5 through 17 in families with incomes below the poverty level. In the spring of each year, NCES renews its interagency agreement with the Small Area Income and Poverty Estimates branch of the Census Bureau to develop and to de deliver to the department school district level Title I poverty and population estimates. These estimates cover most of the nation's public school districts. 
before publication, Census provides the estimates to state agencies and gives states an opportunity to review the estimates and challenge them. This so-called challenge period allows states to present information regarding boundary changes that may need to be updated in the Census Bureau's uh, geographic database. Second, since the mid-1970s, NCES provides assistance for calculation of career and technical education allocations under the Perkins Act. The population groups used in the formula have remained consistent throughout the years, ages 15 to 19, 20 to 24, and 25 to 65, from the Census's annual state population estimates. States' allocations are based on their shares of the count for each of the three age groups multiplied by a factor based on per capita income, which we currently obtain from the Commerce Department's Bureau of Economic Analysis. Next, the eligible groups for adult education state grants has traditionally consisted of those who are age 16 and over, do not have a high school diploma or equivalent, and are not currently enrolled in school. Until 2006, these data were available only from the decennial census. The Census Bureau will now collect these data using the American Community Survey, the ACS. Finally, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is the law authorizing funding for services to individuals with disabilities throughout the nation. Under Part B, Section 619, services must be provided to children with disabilities between the ages of 3 through 5. And under Part B, Section 611, services must be provided to children with disabilities between 6 and 21. Each of these formulas requires annual population and poverty data of 3 through 21-year-olds. These come from the Census Bureau's annual population estimates and the ACS, respectively. By statute, the Department accepts Census Bureau's data and does not question the incidence of over or under counts. We understand that to the extent feasible, the Census Bureau adjusts post census annual population estimates, small area estimates, and ACS data for known shortcomings in the prior decennial census. It is also our understanding that the annual estimates used in our formula grant allocations are informed by recent demographic changes that might affect the distribution of funds. In summary, these examples cited illustrate how the Department of Education uses the array of Census Bureau tabulations to distribute our formula grant funds. We have a history of more than 30 years cooperating with the Census Bureau to uh, provide the data needed for the U.S. Department of Education uh, grants. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Very much, Mr. Karofsky. Uh, and thank you all. Thanks to all of the witnesses for your testimony today. Uh, we will begin the uh, Q&A period now. Uh, each member will have five minutes to ask questions of the panel. Uh, I will begin. Um, this first question is a, um, a uh, uh, panel-wide question. Um, let me, I, I guess it would, it would have to be these last three to ask, and Mr. Golden Collins may have to answer too. Uh, do your formulas account for the undercount that always occurs in certain communities? Or should they account for that? And if, if, if they should or shouldn't, tell me why. Uh, Mr. Richardson, you, we can begin with you. Uh, sure. Um, the sample data that's used in most of our formulas is the published sample data. So most of our variables for our formula are based on the census sample data. And to the extent those are adjusted, and generally they aren't, um, the, our formulas are driven by those. With the exception in the CDBG formula of the population variable and growth lag variable, which are indeed changed each year to reflect the published population estimates from the uh, and if those are challenged estimates, we include those. And, and we're we're uh, statutorily required to to follow the to use the the most recent uh, census data. In the vast majority of cases, there are no instances uh, where we adjust, and it's it's our view that that uh, that statute requires us to to do that. We are similarly uh, statutorily required to use the census data, but in addition, we wouldn't have a firm basis to adjust the data on our own where we have, would we have the statutory authority to do so. Uh, we, we're only able to use the, the, what's presented to us by the Census Bureau as the best available data. Uh, on that point, uh, do the, uh, 
Thank you. Do, on on that point, and we'll, we'll we'll start with you. Do the yearly census estimates uh, adequately adjust formula funding? Uh, to make up for the discrepancies that result from the undercount? I really can't answer that. Where we're allowed to use those data, and we do in, in some instances, uh, our statisticians just simply don't have the basis to make that interpretation. Well, but when... When they send you, when census sends you when, new data, I mean, don't when, you when adjust census, for that? Yes, uh, the, the, we have formulas that allow us to use the post sensual data, and we do use them in those instances, yes. Right. How, how about you, Mr. Moore? And, and again, we don't use any adjusted data, we just use, uh, we just use uh, census data, so, um, and we similarly wouldn't be in a position to comment on the, on the accuracy of that data because we're not in the business of counting people. That would be a question that's probably better suited well, for Well, but, but when data is adjusted, when data is corrected, don't you all have an interest in getting it correct too? Um, clearly we have an interest in, in having population figures that are as accurate as possible, but, it, but again, we're, we're not statutorily allowed to, to um, do the right thing by adjusting the data, correct? Um, it, it's our view that, that the law tells us that, uh, that we're required to use the act. If there were to be changes in how that data would be collected, uh, that would be, those would have to be statutory changes that would be done uh, by Con An annual basis. Um, yeah, we do use, as the, the, annual, the annual adjusted data that comes through, um, that's produced by the census, we do use. Sorry for the confusion. Yeah. Mr. Richardson. Well, as I noted, the, um, we, we do use the, the data that's adjusted um, for population and growth lag in the CDBG formula. And with the American Community Survey, which we will be rolling into our formula starting in fiscal year 2011, to the extent that census updates those numbers to reflect the current population estimates and any challenges that are brought against those population estimates, we would include those in our formulas going forward. As we use the fiscal, and as we use the uh, American Community Survey. Okay, and then how do we we make up for the funding discrepancies once you get new data? Do you do you adjust what you, your your formulas for the new data and new population, like in the case of Toledo? That's, I mean, I heard your explanation about. So Toledo, and actually the CDBG formula is an unusual formula in that if it's one of the few formulas that if you have a declining population, it, you actually get more money for having fewer people, which is an unusual formula in that way. Um, and that was the case with Toledo, which successfully challenged its population estimates. By successfully challenging its population estimates, we rolled in that challenge. And because Toledo was receiving money because of, the few, of how many people it had relative to 1960, when that number increased, it led to a smaller CDBG grant. Um, because the CDBG funds are intended to serve communities in decline, communities that have lost a lot of population get substantially more than communities that have gained now population. That, that CDBG formula can be changed here in Congress or by the, the agency? It's in statute, and it has to be changed by Congress. The, the, President Obama's fiscal year 2010 budget proposal is is uh, asking is proposing that that formula actually be updated and be changed, and we're looking forward to working with the Congress on that. Mr. Golden Cobb, did you have anything? Yeah, I, I think you know to the extent that these formulas um, compensate for the undercount, it all depends on the approach used to correct the data. As Mr. Messenberg said, the census data are updated throughout the decade. Uh, but those updates are largely the result of administrative records. So the extent to which those administrative records capture those people who tend to be historically updated, that, uh, historically undercounted, rather, um, than the better quality data. Uh, but that's an open question on how good those administrative records are. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, no census has ever been actually adjusted using statistical means to compensate for the historic, for the differential undercount or any, any undercount. And so, as we've been saying, the accuracy of all these post census estimates really starts with the quality of the decennial census. And so, to the extent that there has always been an undercount, that undercount has never been 
uh, adjusted, um, then that affects the data going forward. Thank you for that response. Mr. McHenry, you recognize. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Metzenborg, um, although the focus of this hearing is obviously with uh, the American Community Survey and the data put out and the funding formulas and that, uh, in that regard, we haven't had you back uh, since uh, address canvassing uh, was finished. Um, and our, our staffs have been briefed uh, uh, from your folks um, at the Bureau, and we thank you for that. Uh, I know the, you had a pretty strong assessment of, of how well it was, uh, but uh, I know the GAO had a less rosy assessment. But if you could touch on uh, how successful you viewed the uh, address canvassing. Certainly. Uh we view it as a very successful undertaking. Um, as you recall, a year ago, the, there was much, uh, much angst about our ability to make the handheld computers work. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a lot of testing uh, in December and prior to the address canvassing. And we actually started in eight of the local census's uh, offices a week early. Uh, we also, rather than doing it in two waves as originally planned, waves of about uh, five weeks each, uh, we split that into five different waves and we started it in most of the local census offices at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, the result of that is uh, we were pretty well 99% done with us nearly a month ahead of schedule. Uh, the areas that we, uh, we had to wrap up had to do with areas that had flooding, like the Red, uh, the Red River. And uh, we had mudslides in Puerto Rico. We had a tornado in Kentucky. In fact, our finish date is July 17th. We have three assignment areas that we're completing right now. They're in Jackson, Mississippi, which face flooding. Um, and we will complete those. In fact, we are helicoptering uh, canvassers into that area because once they can get into the area they can actually walk the streets and they will finish that operation uh, uh, this week so I, I see it as a as a very successful uh, operation we are doing uh, lessons learned as a result of that uh, we had great success recruiting the goal was to recruit about 700,000 folks to fill 140,000 jobs, and we had 1.2 million applicants for those 140,000 jobs. So uh, we probably had the most highly skilled workforce that we've had on the decennial census, and that was, uh, that was huge for us. Uh, what, are you on budget? Right now, we're, we've run about 15% uh, over budget. And uh, a good amount of that, we're doing a detailed analysis, as you would expect right now. We went into the address uh, operation with an assumption that we would have 10% of the addresses would be deletes, that we would go to there and we'd actually remove them from the list. Uh, we don't have the final number on that, but it's more like uh, almost double, a little less than double of that. What that means is we're going to err in the, uh, in the direction of keeping an address on the address list rather than removing it. So if we have a rec an address that we believe is delete, we're going to send an additional person out to verify that. Uh, that requires more mileage, more, uh, more effort, more enumerator time. So um, we expect that most of that will be associated with uh, the underestimation of the deletes. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion about the handheld computers. Do you believe they worked? Yeah, I believe they worked effectively. I mean, we had some glitches uh, during the first startup uh, operation. Most of those were associated with getting enumerators in touch with the help desk. Uh, but originally, we were assuming uh, something like about 30 percent, uh, a 30 percent uh, volume for help desk, and that turned out to be much less than that. So uh, we had about a week of uh, shakiness there, but the handhelds performed well. Absolutely. Mr. Goldenkoff, uh, what, what's the GAO's, uh, you know, initial uh, 
survey of, of how well address canvassing went. I think it's too early at this point to make any blanket statements about the overall success of address canvassing. So I think you need to parse it out into different components. As you know, there was a lot of concern over the um, uh, handheld devices, and, and as Mr. Messenberg said, um, there were some initial glitches, but um, the, the Census Bureau did an excellent job in overcoming those with, with workarounds. Um, we were out in the field in about 30 different locations. I myself was out in, in uh, Meridian, Mississippi, and also New Orleans, so I saw some of this myself. Um, and um, the, the handhelds really were very effective in helping the address canvassers figure out where they are, not to uh, go over boundaries or into other, other areas. Um, so, so that um, was a, a positive story. Um, they also finished uh, largely ahead of schedule. Uh, which was uh, good news. Um, one of the things that we're looking at there, though, um, was um, uh, quality sacrifice at the cost of, of speed, and so we're, we're looking in, into that. Um, uh, so in terms of some other things, though, that perhaps could have gone better, uh, Mr. Messenberg said um, there are over budget. Um, fingerprinting, as you know, that was uh, an issue, something that we've been looking at pretty closely. and. Um, about 23% of the fingerprint cards um, were unreadable, and my understanding is that those individuals whose cards could not be read or scanned by, by the FBI, so they had an initial uh, applicant name check, but they did not have their fingerprints um, reviewed by the FBI, were still allowed to work. And so there's some a security issue uh, in that, of course, and there's also cost, too, because basically the, the cost the money that was spent on uh, those fingerprints and having them uh, reviewed by the FBI um, just, just went to waste. Um, there were some transmission issues with the, uh, the, the cell phone service in rural areas. Um, not a major issue, it was, it, it, but it, it did um, affect some of the efficiency of the um, uh, address canvassers. Uh, recruiting went well. Um, uh, they had a very good quality workforce, very conscientious. Uh, I think all of the GAO folks that were in the field were very impressed with um, how hard uh, and how, con how conscientious the temporary workers did their jobs. Um, so at this point, uh, as I said, it's uh, just too early to take a comprehensive or make any comprehensive or overarching statements. Thank um, you. But uh, we'll be looking at each of those different components as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. Um, Mrs. Kapter, you recognize five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and I really appreciate being able to participate today, and thank you for your leadership. Um, Mr. Messenberg, I wanted to uh, ask you, the Census Bureau is aware of such communities as Toledo, Ohio, which have suffered undercounting of its population in previous years. We've seen what's happened uh, in the New Orleans region, and one of my concerns is the rising uh, extraordinary level of housing foreclosures. Um, what is the C Census Bureau in these foreclosures in regions like Toledo, uh, obviously the New Orleans area, um, and others, uh, what is the Census Bureau doing to offer additional financial support or assistance training personnel that could help these types of communities that have been so damaged by the economy or natural circumstances to achieve a proper count of their population because uh, it isn't clear that these individuals who are being foreclosed on are leaving their communities. Okay, I'd be glad to uh, talk about that. Perhaps I should just take a second to talk about the Population Estimates Program and the Challenge Program. Um, a as we described before, at the national, the state, and the county level, basically we're starting with the census 2000 count. And then we're adding in births, subtracting deaths for that location, and then doing an adjustment for migration, both international, so someone that immigrated into the US from Europe or wherever, and we use the American Community Survey to do that. We also look at migration, within states and within counties, across counties, and we use the IRS data typically to do that. That's what we call the ADREC uh, data, and we believe that methodology is performing very well. At the sub-county level, we actually, at the, uh, at the sub-county level, for example, for Toledo, what we would use is the housing unit method. So we would start with the estimate of the number of housing units in Toledo in 2000. 
And then we take what the occupancy rate was in 2000 and what the uh, persons per household were in 2000. And we also have an adjustment for group quarters. Uh, right now, the POP estimates program for this sub-county level data is using the census 2000 average person per household and the census 2000 occupancy rate. So I can give you uh, an example for Flint, Michigan of what the impact is of this methodology. So our 2008 POP estimate for Flint, Michigan is 112,900 individuals. If we use the challenge method, and the challenge method, people come in and tell us they have additional housing units. And when they do that, we use the census 2000 per person, uh, average per person household, and we use the occupancy rate. So uh, for example, in Flint, the occupancy rate in census 2000 was 81.9%. From our most recent American Community Survey, which is the three-year estimate spanning 2005 through 7, the occupancy rate is 78.5%. By using the existing challenge method, which used Census 2000, we would have estimated a population growth in Flint of 9.3%. If we actually updated that per person, per household, and the occupancy rate using the most current data, Flint would have had a, a, a reduction of 6.4%. So what I want to clarify is the challenge process, we invite any locality to challenge, and typically of the 39,000 jurisdictions that we publish data, typically about 100 ask for a challenge uh, proposal package, and about 64 uh, actually challenge. When they challenge, if they can come in and demonstrate to us that they have additional housing units, then we will go back and use the census 2000 persons per household and the census 2000 occupancy rate. Given, as you're, as you're talking about, Congresswoman, the decline in occupancy rate that the challenge biases the population estimates up. So if we flash forward a year or two. We probably do not want to be using the 2010 average person per household or the 2010 occupancy rate. So this is one of the things that we have on our research agenda, to look at the housing unit estimate component, which is sub-county, and to also take another look at the challenge process itself. Now, what are we doing to approve the uh, the count we are uh, we're going to spend over 300 million dollars on paid advertising with a huge increase in the advertising that goes into the local areas uh, probably the biggest single thing we're going to do is we're going to have nearly 2900 partnership specialists working in our local offices and we'll have nearly 500 local census offices scattered across the u.s in census 2000 we had about 600 people reaching out to uh, local organizations this time it's more like 2900 so they are the folks they are the trusted voices that we want to be in toledo to, to convince the mayor to convince others form a complete count committee We'll work with you to improve that count. So in, in brief, that's what we're doing. I guess my only comment, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure my time has expired, but in a community like Toledo, over 12% of our housing stock is now foreclosed and the rate is rising. Uh, I was in a neighborhood in Cleveland, Ohio, now declared the poorest city in America over the weekend. And we were in Slavic Village, a neighborhood where they claim 75% of the homes have been foreclosed. And I just wonder, uh, when you go door to door, when you send out material, you know, how you really find the people that used to live in those homes. Okay, so, so what we've done through the address canvassing is identify all the addresses. So if, it's, if it exists, it's on the address list. We did not attempt to make a determination whether it was occupied or vacant, because obviously that could change by April of 2010. 
We think we've done a good job in terms of identifying the addresses. What we are doing is taking a look at our procedures uh, for the non-response follow-up, because you're you're 100 percent correct if that is if that's a vacant housing unit and we mail out a census form we are not going to get a census form mailed back so starting may 1st in 2010 we're going to send an enumerator out to knock on that door in some cases it's obvious that that's a, a vacant uh, housing unit in other cases it's not so obvious. In some cases, maybe someone else is living there or multiple families are living there. We know that's going to be a challenge, but that's got to be part of our communication message to get trusted voices in the people. If someone is doubling up in a housing unit, to, tell, uh, to actually report that accurately. If they don't, we will miss people. And, and just on that, that point, Ms. Kaptur, uh uh, I, I would hope that the Bureau's research uh, would uh, bring to light that there may need there, there may need to be different methodologies in this uh, era of, of housing foreclosures of uh, post Katrina I mean I was down in in New Orleans for the address canvassing uh, and 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 believe you me the enumerators do not have an easy task they have to go up to buildings that may look vacant, but there is electric wires going into the building. So perhaps there's someone living there, and they have to keep coming back day after day to, to figure it out. Uh, so their, their task is not easy either, and hopefully the research will uh, bring us a new methodology. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Back we know there. that we'll have between 10 and 20 million people in this country whose homes will be foreclosed by next year. That is an that is a shocking figure, uh, and we you haven't. Know that the people are somewhere, no. Somewhere. Let me let me go to our, our colleague from Georgia, Mr. Westmore. Recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Messenberg, just to clarify that you you can't do the 2010 census based on where people are living in 2009, correct? That's correct. You have to wait till you send the forms out in 2010. That's correct. We've, the address canvassing has been to build as complete a list of housing unit addresses as we can, and then that's the vehicle to help us deliver report forms. And that's being done with the handheld computers, That correct? was done with the handheld computers. Okay. And in prior testimony that you've uh, testified in front of um, this committee, uh, a lot of the data that you get does come from local city and county governments. Is that correct as far as uh, housing starts or permits, uh, births, uh, deaths? Well, the, uh, the construction information will come from the local government permit office. Information on births and deaths come from the vital record uh, agencies, not, not from the local government. But you do get some information from local government. Oh, certainly. In, in terms of the updates to our construction program, new construction activity. So any construction that's occurred since we finished address canvassing near the end of June and before we do the census, we will be getting building permits flowed to us from local governments and the, we'll have an opportunity to send an enumerator out to actually collect information from those new units. That will happen in uh, late July and August of 2010. Mr. Messenberg, you say you've been at the Census Bureau for 36 years, is that correct? That's, that's so, correct. So Maybe this it's is, almost 37 now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is not your first rodeo uh, no. when it comes to the census. Uh, would you say that the uh, process of doing the census has gotten better uh, over the years? Well, I think it's become more challenging. Um, if we look at just the diversity in terms of additional languages, uh, the recent uh, economic uh, problems that the nation has faced, I think it's clear this is going to be one of our most challenging uh, censuses. We feel we have the procedures in place to conduct a successful census, but we, we believe our partnership program especially is key to deliver that message, to mobilize 
the communities. And I mean, I think we, we've all been uh, very impressed by the energy of the different constituencies mm -hmm. and how committed they all are to make this a successful census. So I think having nearly 2,900 partnership specialists in the field is going to be key for us to connect uh, with local areas. And of course, we'll hire locally also. Sure. That's, uh, that's a key strategy. When, when, just to go back over a little bit of your population estimates program, um, it's my understanding that you start off with a decennial number um, or, or the census. The census count, and, right. And then you add births, subtract deaths. Is that true? That's true. And then um, I guess for the internal migration, um, let's say somebody moves from Patrick's district to a good congressional district in Georgia. <laughs> um, um, what, what kind of data would you use to track that? Okay, so um, for uh, the population that's under 65, we use the IRS uh, tax data to do that from year to year movement. We, uh, that has about 80% coverage of, uh, of the population. For the population 65 or older, we use the Medicare information and we use that address information on, on that. Okay, so that's kind of your formula for coming up with that. Now, how about the American Community Survey? Can you kind of explain to that how um, uh, you use that? Well, the American Community Survey is the replacement for the old long form. Uh, so in 1990, 2000, and previous censuses, one in six households got a long form, and it was long. It's over 50 pages, but that, that's the source of all the social, economic, and household information. So we've replaced that once in a decade long form survey with an Ameri the, the American Community Survey. The American Community Survey sur samples about 250,000 households a month and then publishes data annually. So uh, in, in September, probably September 22nd, we will produce the uh, 2008 estimates for all jurisdictions with 65,000 or more population. And then in December, we will produce the three-year estimate, which will be six, seven, and eight, for all jurisdictions with over 20,000 population. Next December will be the first time we produce the five-year estimates, and those will go down to the very smallest geographic area. So it is really the primary source of the social economic uh, data, poverty statistics, income, information on disability and so on. One final question, if I could, Mr. Chairman. I know that um, this population estimates that you've had, at least from the numbers I've seen, that over the past three decades, you've been really, uh, I guess, plus or minus about 2.5 percent of that's, the decennial number. Is, is that correct? That's correct. In 90 and 2000, it was about 2.5 2 or 2.4 percent under the census number. In, in, in one year it was over? I mean, I think both once, years was under, but I, I can I can double. Uh, double both years it. were under a little bit? Yep. Okay. So, but 2.5% based on the information you're getting is pretty pretty darn close, and I want to commend you and, and the people at the Census Bureau for the, uh, it's the job you've done. And Thank I you. yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. We will do a, uh, a second round of questioning with this panel, and, and I'll start with Mr. Messenborg. Tell me, how does the uh, Census Bureau notify other federal departments of changes in population? Well, we, we produce the popula population estimates on a regular schedule. Uh, so in December of, uh, let me just use the 2008 population estimate. So in December of 2007, we provided the, uh, the national and the state, yeah, okay, the national and the state population estimate. In March of, uh, I, I'm sorry, I should have said December 2008, we produced the national and the state pop estimates for 2008. In March of 2009, we produced the county level pop estimates. 
and then uh, as of July 1st, we produce the uh, the sub county. So we just put those statistics out in the last couple of weeks, July I believe. 1st. Okay, and July 1st. That, July 1st. And you share that with it's on the web, agencies? and it, and I think all of the agencies that are using POP estimates data and their formula are very familiar with the release. Okay. Uh, the release schedule. Mr. Messenborg, along those same lines, is there a plan afoot? to put a moratorium on the Census Challenge program? Well, there'll be, uh, so we'll be putting out the, uh, the 2009 estimate would come, the, the sub-county data using our schedule would come out in July of 2010. Okay. So basically a year from now. So we will put a moratorium on the 2009 challenges because by the time we would evaluate and produce those data, information from the 2010 census will be produced at the state level at you know no later than December 31st, 2010. So we're talking six months. Well, uh, how so long will so the we are. Last? Yeah, let me be clear. So there will be no challenge process on the 2009 estimate. Because by the time we would act on it, we will have better 2010 census data. Now, when we come to, to calendar year 2010, then we have the, um, then we have the estimates from the, the decennial census. So we do not uh, produce public estimates of the POP estimates for 2010. The census counts stand as... Uh, as the count. Thank you so much for that response. Let me go to Mr. Richardson. Mr. Richardson, I, uh, I and many others have concerns about the design of formulas that correct the undercounts uh, and results in an increased number in the population count, yet yields fewer monies to the municipality because of the increase. Uh, this is the result of applying a mechanism called a growth lag. Uh, the growth lag is to assist areas with stagnant population growth. Low-income areas normally have population growths, and wealthier areas tend to have less children and more stagnant growths. Um, can you show me where the benefit of having the growth lag applied to these undercounts counteracts the loss of funds in these poor areas that seemingly would need the funding more. Um, I think that's an excellent point. The, the growth lag variable in the CDBG formula was developed in the 70s to try to address the needs of a lot of communities at that time that were facing significant population loss due to um, a number of factors. And um, the formula was put into statute and has not been changed. Now, HUD has done a number of studies looking at the different variables, including growth lag and how well they target to need. And growth lag does have the problems you know. Um, for communities that are, we're well, are relatively well-off communities that have had population that's stayed the same or gone down even because of smaller household sizes, they get substantial grants under the Community Development Block Grant Program, as do other communities that are seriously distressed. St. Louis, Detroit, Toledo get substantial amount of funding because they've lost population since 1960. So um, in the, the studies we've done, um, there are recommendations um, on how that could be fixed to make the formula so it doesn't ha create these anomalies and ensures that the... Um, the money is directed to the communities that most need it. And um, the, as, as I noted earlier, President Obama in his 2010 budget proposal has indicated a desire to work with the Congress to try to make the changes to make this formula target better. Yeah, and yes, and let's begin by you sharing that, those studies with this subcommittee. Um, absolutely. We'll provide you a copy of that study. In fact, I have one with me. I can leave that with your oh, thank uh, staff. Thank you so much. And I'll recognize my colleague from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Metzenborg, um, there's been some discussion about Hurricane Katrina, and that was a devastating, and still is a devastating event for the Gulf Coast and some, some um, parts 
the Gulf, Gulf Coast region still haven't recovered. And, and Mr., uh, the chairman discussed uh, the difficulties of uh, the address canvassing there. But to, to look at how devastating that was, and it was obviously a horrible event for, for the people of the Gulf Coast, but um, to look at the data that the Census Bureau produced with um, well, I, I've given you two tables, uh, mm -hmm. uh, table one and table two, uh, that come from, from your bureau, one about East Baton Rouge Parish, the other about Orleans Parish, uh, New Orleans and Baton Rouge, in essence. Um, and these are your population estimates uh, for those two counties. And you can see uh, the, the massive uh, loss of population in Orleans Parish and the uptick in East Baton Rouge. And it's, you know, you, it's obvious to deduce that some moved to East Baton Rouge. In Table 2, you actually uh, determine where people moved, migrated from, uh, too. Um, and so uh, I also, uh, can, if you could, if you could talk about a study uh, by three people that work for you, uh, uh, Roger Johnson, Justin Bland, and, and Charles Coleman, who tracked the dislocation of people um, as they left the path of Katrina in the aftermath. Certainly. Uh, well, of course, Katrina uh, pose real challenges to the population estimate. So I talked about at the county level, how we use, start with the census 2000, births, deaths, and then use the tax records and the Medicare records to try to estimate migration. But one of the first things that happened post Katrina is the IRS provided, uh, I think it was a six month extension in terms of filing uh, taxes. So it was clear we had to come up with a different way of tracking that migration. And uh, what we did is we availed ourselves of the Postal Service National Change of Address record. So we could find, we identified all the, the housing units and the individuals pre-Katrina. And then using this postal change of address, we found out where they moved to. They not only moved, of course, uh, within Louisiana, they moved to Houston, they moved to Atlanta, and the, the study you referred to, Congressman McHenry, basically shows large maps exactly where all of those people that we identified pre-Katrina, where they ended up. So I guess I would see that as a demonstration when faced with real challenges that, uh, that the staff can come up with a way to produce the data. And we, know, we knew we needed to do something there. Um, and so, what are the are there additional administrative uh, data that you used aside from the Postal Service, or was that the crux of it here? It, it was primarily this national change of address record. And once we found out where the people had actually moved, then we could also leverage the other administrative record data. But the real challenge was to find out where they had migrated to from New Orleans. Okay, and that's the the. Table two, and I'm sorry we don't have it for the screens. Unfortunately, the screens uh, are not working that's, today. Yeah, but that's um, this one. Um, and how confident are you in in these estimates? Uh, quite confident. I think they've been vetted by uh, vetted by folks. Uh, I mean, given the extraordinary challenges that New or New Orleans area faced, I think this is about as good a job. As, a, as an agency can do in terms of tracking those individuals. Okay. Has the mayor of New Orleans uh, quibbled with the, the data? Uh, I believe the, uh, the mayor has challenged the, the population uh, estimate, and that's not as unusual. I mean, as I say, we typically have about 65, primarily larger cities that challenge the estimate. Okay, so it's a pretty regular occasion, it's, but it's a very open procedure to challenge, and uh, and if if jurisdictions have the data to support an increase in their number of housing units, then typically they are going to uh, win the challenge process. Oh, I see. I, I see. So you they do incorporate that. data. Yeah. Okay, so you do incorporate that on a regular basis. Oh, it, yes. The, okay. Um, Additionally, is, is it more difficult to track uh, race and ethnicity um, following Katrina? Is that an additional challenge uh, 
because, you know, using different administrative data? Um, or is it hard to say? I mean, it's hard. I, I don't want to give you the wrong answer. I'll have to. Uh, we provide uh, the race data at certain level and Okay, so we do produce uh, the detailed, uh, well, the race information at the county level. So it's going to be, uh, I'm confident in it at that level. We do not produce the race data at the sub-county data. So that's the total population is what we're producing there. Okay. So for Fulton County, we'd be confident in that number. I see, I see. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. Uh, this panel will be dismissed, and we will set up for the uh, second panel. Thank you all for your testimony today. Nice meeting you. Likewise. Would you do this? Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Take care of yourself. Did you see Jerry? Jerry sneak in? You've got a happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> you brought him? Oh, cool. I know you do. What's good for you? Yeah, I've missed out on the whole day. Um, yeah. What's going on, man? How about you? I want to talk to you later. Yeah. I'm calling this one time. No, sir. I'm with the Colonel. I'm an intern. Okay. Her name is Frank Davis. Is she still in Long Island? What's your name here? Dorothy Curtin. What's my name? You didn't remember these, so I don't feel as bad now. I'm bad with nothing. Frank Davis. Everybody probably knows that. Frank L. Davis. Everybody knows that. What school did you go to? Um, here? Uh -huh. I haven't been to school. You said you're from Virginia, right? You said you're from Virginia. From the 33rd district. Thank you.
turn to order and uh, we will now hear from our second panel uh, our, our, fir our first witness will be Mr. Carlton uh, Finkbeiner who is the mayor of Toledo, Ohio as mayor of Toledo he has helped bring new living opportunities in the downtown area the mayor is also active in the U.S. Conference of Mayors and was a national chairman of Rebuild America. Thank you for being here, Mr. Mayor. Pleasure to be here, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll, I'll recognize right, you sir. in a minute. I need to swear everyone in. Next, we will hear from Mr. Robert Bowser, who is the mayor of the city of East Orange, New Jersey. Good to see you again, and welcome back. See you. Uh, mayor Bowser is a founder of the New Jersey Conference of Black Mayors, and was selected as president in 2003. He is also a member of the U.S. Conference of Mayors and is vice chair of the 2010 Census Task Force. Our third witness is Mr. Arturo Vargas, the executive director of the National Association of Latino Elected Officials and appointed officials, uh, a national membership organization of Latino policymakers and their supporters. He is a nationally recognized expert in Latino uh, demographic, demographic trends, electoral participation, voting rights, the census, and redistricting. Uh, he currently serves on the 2010 Census Advisory Committee. And welcome back to the committee, Mr. Vargas. And our, our final witness is Mr. Jamie. Alderslay, the Director of External Relations at Social Compact, a nonprofit agency dedicated to fostering private investment in inner city communities. He works on projects that utilize asset based information as a platform for a consensus between local governments, investors, and communities to promote sustainable investment in the underserved urban neighborhoods. Welcome, Mr. Alder Slade, and welcome to all of you. Uh, and thank you for appearing today before the subcommittee. Uh, it is the policy of this committee to swear in all witnesses before they testify. So I'd like to ask you to stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. You may be seated and let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, each of you will have five minutes to make an opening statement. Your complete written testimony will be included in the hearing record. Uh, Mr. Fink Finkbeiner, Mayor Finkbeiner, you may proceed with your statement. Thank you, Chairman Clay. I appreciate this opportunity a great deal. I've been mayor of Toledo for 12 years. My experiences in attempting to get an accurate count of Toledo during that 12-year period of time have been rather frustrating. That is why we hired Social Compact on the recommendation of the mayor of Cincinnati, Mark Mallory, where Social Compact had helped them significantly. I think I can speak today with perhaps as much knowledge as any mayor coming before you, not because I'm a mayor, but because I was a census leader in 1970 in Toledo, Ohio. I want to tell you what I learned from that experience. Many of my counters were elderly females. We began the census count in affluent upper middle and upper middle and middle class neighborhoods. My elder, elderly enumerators felt very comfortable as they walked up and knocked on the doors of rather spacious, extremely well-kept, trendy suburban type households. My enumerators enjoyed themselves immensely. As the weeks progressed and my enumerators completed their task in these middle-class neighborhoods, they methodically worked their way towards Central City, Toledo. As they did, their enthusiasm began to taper off. Their gusto for enumerating poor neighborhoods of significant diversity became really and readily apparent. With multiple-story apartment tenement buildings as part of their daily agenda, I began to lose my crew. 
Ultimately, of the three dozen members of my staff that began, one remained to tackle Central City Toledo neighborhoods. Even though others were brought on board, they did not have the same degree of training and enthusiasm my initial crews did. I began to worry about a serious undercounting of the poor, the disadvantaged, and men and women of color. In the 40 years that have gone by since, there are more poor people than ever living in the heart of our cities, including Toledo. Some are homeless men and women. Some are regular visitors at the shelters that provide food on a daily basis. Others have been released from mental hospitals and seek counseling and meds. These men and women cling to the heart of the city where assistance is available and they are able to fit in as opposed to looking extremely out of the normal in those suburban and middle class enclaves I mentioned earlier. Fast forward to my 12 years as mayor. I asked my neighborhood's department staff to help me estimate how many Jane and John Doe's were being left uncounted. It is the John and Jane Doe's who need the help of the federal government, as well as state and local governments, 501c3s, and nonprofit agencies. If people that are not counted because the U.S. Census workers are tentative at best, as they count the central city, marching door to door, apartment to apartment, homeless shelter to homeless shelter. How can we assure we are identifying all of our citizens? One thing I know for sure, there are more men and women, women living in mobile housing unit conditions in bleaker environments and in growing numbers today than back in 1970 when I had my experience. These men and women desperately need the help of our federal government and our federal agencies. Our responsibility is to find out how to get each and every one of these men and women counted by the U.S. Census. During the past few years, there have been numerous reports saying that the city of Toledo, as well as Lucas County, is losing population. In preparation for our 2010 census, the staff of the Toledo Plan Commission at my direction and with the help of Social Compact, identified over 1,400 addresses previously not recorded on the U.S. Census Bureau's current address list. This confirmed my suspicion that there was a population undercount of housing units from 2000 to 2007 in the city of Toledo. In fact, the adjusted estimate meant that Toledo's population in 2007 was actually higher than in 2000, far from declining as had been consistently reported over several years. To the credit of the Department of Commerce and the U.S. Census Bureau, they acknowledged Toledo had a population of 316,851, some 21,822 more people than the U.S. Census Bureau's original 2000 population estimate. The date of that acknowledgement was January 9, 2009, and I attach a copy of the letter. Then to my surprise, on June 2, 2009, I was sent a letter from HUD's Office of the Assistant Secretary for Community Planning and Development stating that as a result of Toledo's successful challenge, the city will actually be receiving $293,585 less in Community Development Block Grant funding in fiscal year 2009. A copy of that letter is also attached. CDBG entitlement community grants are a vital source of funding from HUD directly to Toledo. The ability to use the grants flexibly allows my administration the freedom to respond to the very specific housing and development needs of Toledo's low and moderate income communities. At a time when great efforts are being made to stimulate the economy, CDBG funding serves as a vitally important role in that endeavor. Having successfully participated in the Census Challenge Program, we expected to receive a larger allocation in CDBG funding particularly because there are more poor men and women now moving toward the center of our cities, including Toledo, than ever before. If there are more people in the city of Toledo, as confirmed by the federal government, but increasing poverty and unemployment, and ours tops at about 12 percent, why would C City of Toledo CDBG allocation be reduced? I can only conclude that the CDBG allocation formula needs to be addressed to rectify the situation facing the city of Toledo. 
In closing, the City of Toledo, regardless of current formula allocations, will continue to strive for accurate data for investment and planning purposes. And we will continue to work cooperatively with our community and the U.S. Census Bureau to make sure every Toledoan is counted. Each human being is given a name at birth. Until death, they are to remain a concern of a caring society. Without a name or an identity, they may be well they may as well be condemned to death. None of that, none of us want that. Therefore, let's make sure every person is counted. One concluding comment. A death occurred in our community 48 hours ago. The man that died was 68 years of age. He had been a homeless man in Boston for about 15 to 20 years. He was born and raised in Toledo. He got some aid and assistance when he was in Boston, and his family urged him to come back to the family home in Toledo. 15 years ago, he returned. The last 15 years, that man has made such an impact upon life in the neighborhood in which he lived, and he still looked very, very skinny and very bearded and very disheveled, and he rode a bike everywhere. But that man was going to educate Board of Education meetings, he was going to social service meetings, criminal justice meetings. That man made such, such a difference that when about 10 days ago, he unfortunately was knocked off his bike by a youngster and hit his head on the pavement and was in a coma for 10 days. And our community came to a stop for 10 days while Bob in a coma in a hospital. He died 48 hours ago. That man was once homeless because he was identified and a real person as a result of the Boston metropolitan area social service people. He came back and made a very, very significant contribution to Toledo the last 15 years of his life and will be deeply missed. That's why every man or woman needs to be counted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor, for your testimony. Mayor Bowser, you're recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Clay and Ranking Member McHenry and members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm always glad to be in Washington to see where my money is going. Um, Please make sure your microphone is on. Is it? Okay. Um, on behalf of the, the city of East Orange, New Jersey, I urge all of our people to be counted in the 2010 census. Everyone's participation is vital to ensure our voices are heard in Congress. And a complete count also almost guarantees our community would get its fair share of federal dollars, which would make money for schools, hospitals, roads, and social services. This count includes the homeless, the legal, and the undocumented. We are all entitled to the same services provided within our city. It's easy important and safe to participate, and all of this information is confidential. To ensure account in the CV SNARS, we plan to engage our community with a team of people, coordinators, leaders of various ethnic backgrounds who look like and speak the same language of the people we are counting. A complete and accurate count means a sustainable, better way of life for all people. Historically, in the city of East Orange, we believe that the last two census counts were seriously flawed, resulting in an undercount in excess of 12%. As a city, we rely on accurate population figures for all state, county, federal applications for grants and supplemental aid for many, if not all, programs. In this present economy, municipal government has to fight for and look for fiscal help wherever it is available. The census figures are the one common factor in all applications and the compelling argument for justification and need. We at the local level must meet our obligation to provide services and the opportunity for services for all our constituents. At this hearing, we were asked to comment on the impact of the undercount on funding formulas and how this would affect local communities. First, let me say it is important to distinguish between concerns about funding formulas and the concerns about allocations under the formulas. The question of whether funding formulas are designed properly or whether they take into account the conditions Congress desires to address separate from the is separate from the question of the accuracy of the data used 
to allocate funds under the formulas. Without going into the details about CDBG funding, there are two, two formulas, A and B. Both of them rely on census data. And when they are calculated, the formula, either A or B, that gives more uh, uh, justification for funds, that is the one that is used. Under these formulas, justifications always receive more funds than the total amount available through appropriation to bring the allocation within the appropriate amount HUD uses. They use a prorated reduction that may be different annually. In East Orange population, it is not correctly calculated in the most recent census. The argument could be made that either formula A or B can be calculated accurately to allocate to this jurisdiction because 50% of Formula A and 20% of Formula B relies on the accurate population count. Even if one formula is used instead of the other, an inaccurate census count could greatly Because in East Orange we also have a high number of house rentals and apartment units. Let me just give you a little information about the city of East Orange. We are only 3.9 square miles, but 83% of our buildable land is residential. We were cut in half by the Garden State Parkway, and then we were quartered economic within the category of 50 to 100,000 people. East Orange has the highest percentage of people of color in all of the United States of America, close to 95%. One other factor that we found out is home ownership in the city of East Orange uh, was less than 35% eight years ago. Because of the census and the fact that it was inaccurate, and we went out and checked about 40 of the census tracts, and we, we had no means to challenge that count. But because of that fact that that percentage of home ownership was so low, we went into a first-time homebuyers program, and what we did was educate the population, we made sure we helped people get their credit better. We gave them counseling. Now, in 2009, we're at 47% home ownership, and we have avoided a lot of the foreclosures in our city because of the fact that we were challenging some of the census numbers in our own right. Also in our city, to compound our problem is that Homes that are one and two family, 40% of them are owned by senior citizens. Of that number, 43% of them are on fixed income, retired, and have no mortgage. Every time we look to increase taxes, this is the group that is most vulnerable. When you look at, when you talk about undercounting, the historic fact is the factors that affect an undercount are people of color, low-income populations, immigrants with limited English proficiency, young people, and unemployed people. The city of East Orange is in a lot of trouble because that fits our demographics right away. Um, and what we need to do to make sure is that we count everybody. If you take a few things that you can use as parameters, because our population right now is said to be, with all the adjustments, I, I have no idea how they make them is 69,824 people. But if you look at our water consumption, it should be somewhere around 77,000 people. If you look at our school population, which includes public schools, charter schools, private schools, and daycare, it should be somewhere between 73 and 75,000 people. If you look at, 70, at solid waste disposal, it should be somewhere around 72,000 people. Something went awry because at the first count, in this count coming up, if it's wrong in the first year, it's wrong for the next nine years. That is a problem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Vargas, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member McHenry for the opportunity to appear before you today on behalf of the Naleo Educational Fund. You know, a successful census requires an accurate count of the estimated 47 million Latinos in the nation. We are the second largest population group and the fastest growing population. 
an undercount of the Latino population means a failed census, and it will skew the distribution of federal resources to states and localities. Many of the federal programs allocated using census data are critical to the education and health of Latino families, such as the Department of Education's Title I grants, Department of Health and Human Services Head Start and SCHIP programs. These programs are just three of the federal initiatives that have proven successful in helping children living in poverty to succeed in school and lead healthy lives. Without accurate 2010 census data, we will not be able to accurately assess the number of children in need nor allocate sufficient resources for them. And an undercount of the Latino population will also have a significant impact on the fair distribution of federal funding in states and cities with large Latino populations. Nearly half of the nation's federal funding allocated using census data is distributed to nine states where nearly 80% of the nation's Latinos reside. This, these amounts range from $3.5 billion for New Mexico to nearly $42 billion to California. In addition, $43 billion in federal funding rely, that rely on census data, about 11% of the nation's total, is distributed to the five metro areas where one out of four Latinos live. Latino elected officials at the state and local levels know the harm caused by the undercount. And in my written testimony, we present four examples of elected officials around the country who are dealing with the problems caused by the undercount. These officials recommend changes to the Bureau's Census Challenge Program to ensure that yearly population estimates are more accurate. The Latino elected officials we have surveyed recommend that the Bureau help jurisdictions to better understand the data and evidence required for a successful challenge and the criteria that the Bureau uses to accept challenges. So to help avoid an undercount and the harm that it brings, we offer the following recommendations for the 2010 Census. First, Congress must provide the Census Bureau with sufficient funding to conduct the Census. The House has approved census funding that is $206 million below the President's request. This seems to be the result of a misunderstanding between House appropriators and the Department of Commerce over certain carryover funds. The Senate Appropriations Committee has approved census funding at a level closer to the President's request. We urge the Senate to adopt the committee recommendation and urge appropriators to restore the $206 million in conference that appears to have been inadvertently cu cut by the House. Second, the U.S. Senate must expeditiously confirm the nomination of the Director of the Census Bureau. The delay on Dr. Groh's confirmation is impairing the ability of the Bureau to proceed on track. Third, the Census Bureau must implement a communications and outreach plan that takes into account the current economic and social realities. The security measures implemented after September 11, including provisions of the Patriot Act, have raised con concerns about confidentiality. Hurricane Katrina and other natural disasters have displaced thousands of residents. We are in the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, with thousands having lost their homes to foreclosures. Millions are living disengaged from our country's civic life. The paid advertising campaign needs to reach these Americans. As a member of the Joint Advertising Advisory Review Panel, I joined with my fellow members in raising concerns about the proposed advertising campaign that was initially developed. We are heartened to see that the communications contractors have taken into consideration the views of the JARP and retooled the messaging of the campaign. Last week, we were presented with a plan that was much more cohesive, better promoted the confidentiality and safety of the census, and reflected the economic times. This retooled campaign will need to further testing and refinement, and time is of the essence. We encourage Congress to continue its vigilance over this crucial component of the 2010 communications plan. In addition, the lack of an English language paid media strategy directed at Latinos is problematic. The Census Bureau will fail to reach a large segment of the hard to count population if it relies exclusively on Spanish language media to reach all Latinos. Special strategies will also be required to count immigrants because our nation's ongoing immigration policy debate has exacerbated their fear of contact with government agencies and have increased hate crimes. The Bureau must use strategies that overcome this distrust and all public agencies must work to promote public confidence in the census. The Census Bureau must ensure that its 2010 workforce reflects the diversity of the nation's population, from its highest managerial positions to its field enumerators. Latinos are the most underrepresented segment of the Bureau's permanent workforce, comprising less than 6%. As the Bureau continues to exploit its massive workforce, it must hire a diverse group of top managers to read its regional operations. The hard-to-com population to effectively reach the hard-to-count population, 
The bill must also hire enumerators who are familiar with local communities and their residents. In many neighborhoods, these workers must be bilingual. We have heard reports from some areas that sufficient bilingual enumerators are not available to hire, particularly in areas with emerging populations. Congress should closely monitor the implementation of the Census in School program. This was one of the success, success stories of Census 2000, and we're concerned that we're not going to have the same aggressive implementation of Census in the Schools in 2010 that we had in 2000. Finally, Congress must reject any proposals that would prevent the full enumeration of every U.S. resident in the census. These proposals are contrary to the fundamental precepts of our Constitution, which calls for a full count of every person residing in the nation. We strongly condemn the efforts of a small group of extremists and even a member of this legislative body calling for a census boycott. Encouraging anyone to not participate in the census is simply wrong. The Naleo Educational Fund remains committed to being a partner with the Congress and the administration in assuring the success of the 2010 count, and we look forward to working with you on this and look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Vargas, for your testimony, and thank you for the work you do. Mr. Alderslay, adding cleanup. Good afternoon, Chairman Clay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Ranking Member McHenry. Good afternoon, Congresswoman Kapter. Uh, many thanks for this opportunity to discuss the important matter of how census data is used in federal formulae. On a personal note, I came to this country four years ago to social compact, and now I'm testifying on Capitol Hill. It's incredible. <laughs> Today I want to make three brief points. Accurate demographic data is critically important as a component of driving sustainable economic development in our cities, especially in our underserved neighborhoods. Close collaborative partnership between local governments and the Census Bureau is the nation's most important driver for generating that data. Thirdly, every conceivable effort should be made to ensure that e the evolution and strengthening of this vital partnership between, bureaus in the, between the Census Bureau and the cities continues. If there is one lesson that we have learned over the course of 10 years of conducting our pioneering drill down research, in 350 underserved neighborhoods across this country, where we found underserved neighborhoods to be far larger, far safer, and with far greater buying power than previously thought. It is that information matters, and there is no more important source of information in this country than that produced by the Census Bureau. As you have heard from my fellow esteemed panelists, census data defines everything from how much federal and state funding a city may receive to its prospects for attracting investment. When demographic data is accurate, investment decisions are more informed, policy more refined, and funding allocations fairer. To ensure accurate census information, it is imperative that there are strong partnerships between local governments and the Census Bureau. We therefore fully support the Census Bureau's development of the Census Challenge Program, a major step in the evolution and strengthening of alliances between local governments and the Bureau. Since 2001, 251 challenges have been, by local governments have been recognized by the Census Bureau, resulting in a population adjustments of 1.8 million people to the con contesting jurisdictions. So far, Social Compact has worked with six cities, including the great city of Toledo, Ohio, across the country to provide the Census Bureau with better local data, resulting in an aggregate adjustment of almost 200,000 additional residents. The very existence of the Census Challenge Program, a program designed by the Census Bureau, and the City of Toledo's participation in that program is the clearest signal possible that both the Bureau and local governments are committed to building stronger alliances. When that alliance is weakened or compromised, no one benefits. The Census Bureau gets incomplete and irregular data from cities. Cities and states don't get their appropriate share of funding from federal government sources. Investors don't get the accurate market information they need. And perhaps most importantly, communities get undercounted. As you have heard from my fellow panelists, suspicion or a lack of understanding over how census data are used in federal formulae greatly compromises this crucial partnership. Indeed, the example of the reduction in CDBG funding to Toledo has, has the result of its partici participation in, census, in the Census Challenge Program actually discourages cities and local governments from working with the Census Bureau. This must be addressed immediately. For local governments to continue to submit accurate local data to the Census Bureau, the formulas that include population factors and are used by federal agencies need to be transparent and trusted by cities. Specifically, I have four recommendations. 
An immediate review is required of the formulas that HUD uses to determine allocations of the CDBG entitlement grants. As it stands, the current formulas used by HUD discourage cities from submitting accurate local data to the Census Bureau. Greater research is urgently required on the impact of census figures on all funding for local governments that is determined by formulae. The city of Toledo knows to the dollar amount the reduction in CDBG funding as a result of participating in the challenge program, but has little idea of the dollar impacts on other funding it receives. Cities need to know this. Once this research has been completed, tools should be developed for local governments so that they may plan for changes in population and corresponding changes in funding. For instance, could a funding calculator be developed that enabled local governments to plug in their population to calculate their predicted funding from federal state programs? Finally, there may be more that cities and the Census Bureau could do to support the development of sound and transparent funding formulae. One suggestion is a review of the current data collected by local governments by the Census Bureau to determine annual population estimates. Are there additional local data sources that can be collected that will not only improve accuracy, but perhaps inform future funding formally development? In conclusion, the census is the best and most important demographic database we have in the United States, but it can be greater still by ensuring close collaboration with local governments, especially uh, with populations with high minority and LMI communities. Social Compact will continue to work diligently to foster mutually beneficial partnerships between local, local governments and the Census Bureau. By urgently addressing these issues outlined in the part, uh, today in partnership with federal agencies, the Census Bureau, and local governments, we will have taken a major step towards achieving our common goals. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, and thank the entire panel for the, their testimony. I will now uh, defer to my colleague. Ms. Captur for questions. To begin questioning, recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you so much for that. Uh, Mayor Finkbeiner of Toledo has to be leaving his plane is uh, on the runway, <laughs> and um, so I I appreciate your graciousness and and uh, Ranking Member McHenry also uh, very much appreciated. And Mayor, thank you for your excellent testimony, uh, which will be made a part of the permanent record and for your experience in the area of census. So I'm going to ask my questions real quickly so you can get them on the record and any other matter you think we should know regarding the census. Um, no one has worked harder than you have to gain a full count and funding to support the count inside the city of Toledo and Lucas County, which is now suffering from double-digit unemployment. Can you tell us how easy it was for you to share your discovered undercount with the Census Bureau? And did you face any challenges? And if so, how did you overcome them? And what recommendations do you have for this panel as we face the next census? That's a great question, Congresswoman Kaptur. For well, I, as you know, I was elected in 93 and took office in 94, and I think for the better part of that eight years, um, it, it bothered me that I did not feel that the re consistent reporting of Toledo's population dropping, dropping, dropping could be validated. And our efforts to reach from the regional office in Detroit to the local office in Toledo was met with respect was met with dignity, but we basically, in my judgment, got a cold shoulder. It was like, we know what we're doing, we're the professionals, and uh, you're just like every other mayor in America, you think you have more people than, than we do. But having had that experience that I referred to in 1970, where I lost 35 out of 36 of my crew, and that was the train crew. The people that were bought in behind him were nowhere near as well trained as that initial crew. I, I, I have had great concerns. When uh, I learned that Cincinnati had gained over 20,000 people in population, I called Mark Mallory, the mayor, and Mark told me that he had done that only because he had felt the same frustration and inability to reach the census people as I had, and he said there's a firm social compact. They're very, very modest in what, what they charge you, and they helped me find 25,000 uh, Cincinnatians. They actually then, the uh, suburban communities uh, plugged into it, and they actually found another 10,000 people in suburbia that were undercounted. So I think their total gain was 35,000, and that would be, I believe, Hamilton County. We, we got in touch with uh, Social Compact, and they helped us know the formula, 
boy, it was very quick. It was only a matter of probably 60 to 90 days that we felt we were in great position to claim there was approximately 22 or 23,000. And when it all came down, this is very interesting, Congressman, we were only off by 11. Uh, we, we really, the number we submitted was, was, was corrected by 11 persons uh, by the U.S. Census Bureau. But then we get into this, that was the 2007 count. Now, just recently, they released the 2008 count, and they subtracted 2,500 people from us and didn't give us credit for the 22,600 people we had gained. So it's rather confusing than the letter saying we're going to have money subtracted. And the most important thing about this is, and I did listen to the explanations, Congresswoman, that were given, but it doesn't make sense when if you think there's a recession going on in 48 states, come visit Michigan and Ohio because there's a, there's a depression in Michigan and Ohio, 25% unemployment in Detroit, Michigan, 12.5% in, in Toledo. At the very same time, we're saying there's more, poor, there's more people in Toledo, and we know a fair share of them are the socially disadvantaged and economically disadvantaged because all the services are in the heart of our city, um, and, and our unemployment is 12.5%, and we have money pulled back from us. That just doesn't make any sense. So to answer your question very directly, I'm grateful for the recognition of the fact that there's 22,600 more Toledoans than thought, but I don't think I should have had to actually go and hire an agency to get that point across to the uh, Census Bureau. I think the testimony of our mayor is very, very revealing, Mr. Chairman, and um, I uh, know that what you've said will be taken into consideration. I don't know if we have representatives of the Census Bureau still in the audience. Uh, I hope we do. They They're are, listening as well. They are here. And I thank the chairman for that and Mayor Finkbeiner for your great leadership over so many years. Tough, toughest job in America to be a mayor. I don't want to be, if you'll allow me to make one more word, but I think it's important, Chairman Clay, Congresswoman Kaptur, Congressman. Um, God bless them. But did you note today that the leadership that spoke to you was all white? The largest group of uncounted men and women in America is not, I don't believe, the white population. I, I believe it is the African-American, Hispanic, Latino, Asian population. People still fear people that are different than themselves. And we're getting over it, slowly but surely we are getting over it, but we're not there yet. And in the very heart of the cities is a significant proportion of your African-American, Latino, uh, Hispanic, Asian, populations and we can't have them undercounted and the best way we can get them counted is to have people that are familiar with them doing the counting not afraid to be in those tall tenement buildings or in the poor neighborhoods that is something that the u.s census bureau needs to make a commitment to in my judgment i do have to catch that plane <laughs> <laughs> the census bureau will not Certainly be well, well census bureau will not be dismayed by that <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Congress members. This is a hugely important issue to this nation. Thank, Thank you. you, too, Mr. Mayor, uh, for your service to Thank that to right. Toledo Mr. and the country. Thank you, sir. And we understand you are excused. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McHenry, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Clay, uh, and thank you all for your testimony. I, I really appreciate you being here. I know it's been a long day uh, with the votes and everything else, but thank you. Uh, Mr. Alderslade, Al I'm uh, having a hard time getting words out here. I, can you provide just a sort of quick synopsis of what your organization does? Absolutely. Um, we are a national non-for-profit organization based literally 10 blocks away from here. Um, of uh, business leaders committed to promoting investment in low and moderate income, usually minority communities. Um, we, through our pioneering market analytic tool, something called the drill down, um, conduct market analysis uh, in these typically undercounted, underserved communities to essentially make the business case for the first time. Um, usually these communities are defined by what's bad about them. We know, we know to a science what's bad about these communities, but we have no narrative for what's good and what the market opportunities are. Without market opportunities, you don't get private sector investment. So we make the business case. We've done this in 350 underserved neighborhoods across 20 cities, including mm -hmm. 
uh, Washington, D.C., we found no. 1.5 million more people, $35 billion more buying power, and these communities are far safer than previously thought. Okay. On your, in your website, um, you know, you mentioned that your organization uncovers census errors. Um, and one interviewer stated that social compacts researchers like an, are, are like inner city bloodhounds. They sniff out people who are un, overlooked by the census. How do you do that? I mean, I, I, don't want, I don't want you to give away any secrets for your organization, but how's that done? That, that's, a, that's an incredible, I don't know whether to be pleased about that description or not. I don't know. Yeah. Um, in terms, there are two things we do. The drill down which is uh, using uh, public and private sector data. That's about purely about making the business case and helping uh, uh, Mayor Finkbeiner and Mayor Mallory and all sorts of mayors make much more um, investment in information-oriented policy decisions in a bid to attract investment. In terms of the cities that we've helped and are currently helping now with census challenges, that methodology is defined by the Census Bureau. They, uh, it's been around since 2001. It uh, ch challenges the, is, is the wrong word. It's, it, it sounds combative, um, but it's the name of the program, unfortunately. Um, the, the Census Challenge Program allows local governments to participate uh, every, every year, just as New York City does, just as Toledo did last year, um, using uh, defined methodology that was created by the Census Bureau, um, and it allows uh, local governments to contribute um, construction data f over the course of the last 10 years. Um, what we found is that uh, there have been some issues with it. In, in a sense, the existence of this program is fantastic. When, when um, uh, cities are successful in their challenge, that really is a, you know, it's no better signal that the Census Bureau and um, local governments can work together to produce accurate results. Um, do you use enumerators or do you use existing data? We use existing data. So when we did Toledo's, we used existing construction data that they had lying around their, their, um, their departments as a, you know, collected as a result of uh, just being a, a city government. Um, is this an error or a, 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 is it a willful omission or is it an error no, on the Census Bureau's part? Uh, uh, no, it just needs, uh, it just needs some improvement. Uh, the acting census director is exactly right. There are 13, 39,000 jurisdictions that can challenge, but we've only had 251 in the last 10 mm -hmm. years. Um, it's not that uh, cities are happy with, with their estimates. It's that, that essentially every month the Census Bureau sends a construction form called the C404 form to um, 39,000 jurisdictions across the country. And they're meant to fill this out and send it back in. If you don't know what the value of that form is, if you don't know what the implications are for your funding or your investment prospects or the perception of your city, it either gets sent to the wrong person or the mayor doesn't think it's important or it just gets lost in the, in the hundreds of thousands of things that cities have to do. So in a sense, what we're trying to do is correct that relationship, is to say to mayors, this information, if you work in partnership on an ongoing basis um, and provide the data locally that you need, uh, that the census needs will counter the need for census challenges going forward. The census challenge is a, is a great program because it's a, uh, a partnership branch given out by the Census Bureau to say that we will work with you. Yeah. Would you contend that the estimates, that the uh, decennial enumeration is more accurate than the estimates? It's a, tr yeah, it's a tricky question. Um, uh, our experience of, uh, uh, through the drill down the work that we do, our experience of uh, counting um, the populations in central city, minority, uh, low and moderate income populations would suggest no, it, that it isn't. For those communities, um, it, it's still a challenge. We found in th just 350 underserved communities, 1.5 million more people. Um, but it, that's based off the estimates, correct? No, this is based off transactional data and... and well, uh, no, I mean, you found extra people than the Census Bureau estimated were there in 2007, exactly. correct? That's, that's well, above what we found. That's but what we found. Th that, that was based off of the population estimate of the census, not the actual enumeration. 
So no, that ba that's based off the drill down methodology, which uses administrative data and private sector data um, to build up a real time population number. So, so just from our experience on the undercount in those communities, for the missed market, the enormous missed markets that we identify in, in low income communities, uh, the evidence would suggest that in low and moderate minority communities, the, the decennial count and, and estimates is, okay. is, has a difficult job. Uh, Mr. Fargus, I, I appreciate your leadership within the Latino or Hispanic community to, uh, say, participate. Uh, the, the Constitution's very clear uh, about participation in the census. Um, and uh, it is who is here on Census Day. Um, and I appreciate you, you being vocal about this. Within your testimony, your, your, uh, what you said during your testimony is that you have concerns uh, about a lack of an English-speaking campaign, media campaign towards the Hispanic community. Are there other recommendations specific like that that you have for the Bureau? Uh, there are, sir, and thank you for that question. You know, I, as a member of the Joint Advertising Advisory Review Panel, mm -hmm. Uh, I had an opportunity to see the initial uh, creative that had been developed by the communications mm -hmm. vendors, and uh, I don't know if you got word, but we issued a vote of no confidence uh, in the contractor's ability to carry out that campaign because the messages were not messages for 2010. They were messages for 1990. Uh, they were a feel-good campaign, come and join and participate. Well, people right now, it's hard to feel good when you're losing your homes and you're losing your jobs, and I th we, we're thinking that the Bureau really needs to bring some sense of reality about how important the census is to help this country move forward. And that was the kind of messaging we think that, need, that can resonate, certainly within the Latino population. And with respect to language use, uh, obviously to reach the immigrant population, it's absolutely critical to use Spanish language media. But many of the hard to count populations have been here three, four generations, and they have Many of them may be living in poverty, feel marginalized from society, and they don't watch Spanish language media necessarily. They're watching English language media, and the Bureau, th their effort is to say, well, we'll cover them with the Diverse America campaign. Our recommendation is, no, you have to talk to them specifically and overcome cynicism that, you know, that it doesn't matter to be counted. You know, these are the kinds of folks who also believe that my vote doesn't count, no one cares what I have to say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on the outs. That's the population that doesn't participate. And that's the population that we need to invest money in in reaching. Um, you, you said there, there's some difficulty to get enumerators within emerging communities, meaning, for instance, in my, my district, there, there's a significant emerging Hispanic population. That's right, sir. Yes. Uh, and, so and what going to the Bureau, they've been fantastic to, and very open about uh, wanting input. Uh, we have a significant Hmong population, for instance, in my district as well. Very few uh, across this country, very few areas of this country actually have a, uh, a Hmong population. Of, so, you know, those type of regional issues. Uh, has the Bureau been open with you and, and collaborative with you and being a partner to find those enumerators? They have, but I think they're hamstrung with some, some policy concerns. Uh, working for the Bureau is a federal job, and you need to be a U.S. citizen. So I have no problems or concerns that we, the Bureau will not find enough U.S. citizens who speak Spanish in L.A. or in San Antonio or in Chicago or New York. I'm more concerned about the communities that you represent, where it's an emerging population, more, more immigrant than established communities, so you have less of a U.S. citizen population that is bilingual that the Bureau could tap into to hire. Uh, in addition, Foreign nationals from Mexico who are work authorized cannot be hired by the federal government today. And so in those communities where you have growing Mexican immigrant populations, that's a double hamstrung that the Bureau has. And those are some policy concerns that we think the Congress should look into. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Bowser, just uh, in conclusion before I hand it back over to Chairman Clay before he gives me the hook here. Uh, you mentioned some discrepancies between, you know, sewer u users, uh, your number for sewer users versus water users, and you have these different uh, numbers that you have. What are your recommendations for the Bureau to get a better count of, of uh, your residents? Well, I, I think, unlike putting it all on the Census Bureau, I think it's incumbent upon, like, the mayors and leaders in the community to make sure we get the proper representation 
uh, in, in my city, right, we, we historically have talked at least for the last 15 years that we have over 20% Haitian population. We haven't counted them yet. Uh, uh, and so what we're doing is making sure that we have represent, representatives in the uh, enumerators and it should be insisted upon by the, the Census Bureau that we cover all of these. We have a, a large South uh, African population, Caribbean population. Our Latino population is growing it's some, somewhere, and as an estimate, is, is three to six percent. But we're making sure that we have people that can go to those places and speak to them, speak their same language, you know, dress like some of the other folks. So we do that. But we can't put that all on the Census Bureau. Right, this is our one opportunity to make this thing work. But what the Census Bureau needs to do is insist on their regional coordinators that they get the proper people that can go out there and count folks. Don't put it all on them, right? All you have to do is make sure they got the money to do it. So if you're talking about cutting some money from the Census Bureau, don't do it. Amen. Please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank Mr. You, Mr. McHenry, you answered, um, you asked almost all of my questions too. <laughs> Let me start with Mayor Bowser. In your testimony, you mentioned HUD's home program and how uh, the undercounting of rental units by the U.S. Census Bureau has negatively impacted funding for your city of East Orange. Um, please elaborate on your specific frustrations with the Census Bureau and HUD and how you believe either federal department could improve their programs. Well, the, the home program, um as I said early on, is, is that we have a large population. It's pretty much on fixed income. We have a waiting list to, to rehab homes based on access to, to home dollars. It may be somebody might be out there for three years waiting to just bring their houses up to basic code because that's all the money is, is really for. But in addition to that, some of the home money can be used for uh, affordable housing and, and startups and things like that. Um, the problem that we have is if you look at the numbers based on the census, we think that we are, sh you know, shortchanged, so we don't have the dollars to really help our total population that is asking for and looking for some of that help. Um, and and it, it's it's been a problem, and and I just hope that this time going around that we're able to fix those numbers. To, to get it right, but have you as the mayor or as the city of East Orange, have you challenged uh, these, the census data, the census estimates through the challenge program? Well, we, did, we didn't do it this, this past time for 2000, but we did in 1990 because it was such a large number that we felt was wrong. I mean, basically there are areas in your city that do not change, uh, very stable, families and homes. So what you need to do is put your effort into the areas that have the most problems that it's very difficult and to get I into. I hope you make acquaintance with Mr. Alderslade today <laughs> when, when we when this I got his card, sir. Yes. <laughs> Let me move on to Mr. Vargas. Um, given that there is a historical undercount, do the yearly uh, census estimates and the appeals and the adjust adjustments from the estimates, does that adequately uh, rectify the discrepancies in, in funding to local Latino communities uh, that result from that undercount initially? No, I don't believe so, sir. And I think the point has been made earlier that if the baseline data are inaccurate to begin with from the decennial census, then all subsequent data throughout the next nine years continue to be inaccurate. I would like to point out, however, that we're going to be following very closely the use of the American Community Survey data. Uh, when Congress reauthorized the Voting Rights Act of 1965, for example, it indicated that the ACS data could be used every five years to update the jurisdictions that would be required to be covered under Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act that requires language assistance in voting to U.S. citizens who are limited to the English proficient. So we will be following that very closely to see if, in fact, the ACS has a sufficient sample size uh, every year to accurately determine whether or not we're targeting uh, implementation of our voting rights laws accurately. So for your community, it's like a moving target. I mean, uh, we have estimates that there are 47 million Latinos within our population. 
but but it's hard to get a gauge on that. I mean, you're coming in at what, twenty eight million? Well, um, twenty nine. Well, the last census put us at some thirty some million, but. I think one of the most interesting statistics the census recently, recently indicated is that you know this country grows by a person every 15 seconds. Every 30 seconds, that person is a Latino or Latina. Mm. I read that somewhere. <laughs> Thank you for your response. Uh, Mr. Aldersley, if uh, GAO is able to determine a new and accurate per year or value do of dollars lost uh, for each undercounted person in local community, what would this number mean uh, for your work with Social Compact and your efforts to secure private investments in inner city neighborhoods? It's a great question. Um, the, 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 there's two sides to this. So on that assumption, you would assume that uh, mayors, counties, and state governments would get more federal funding dollars to spend on CDBG, economic development programs, um, the, 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 invest, uh, the uh, programs that support mayors in creating jobs and attracting investment. Uh, on the other side of things, uh, a, a, a report done by the Brookings Institute estimated that 80% uh, of all retail investment decisions uh, use data derived from the census. Um, now, over the course of the next four years, conservatively, we're even within the uh, economic downturn that we're in, um, th there are estimates that there will be $250 billion of commercial investment over the course of the next four years. So if you have accurate counts um, and an estimate, an estimate, just as we found in New Orleans, 50,000 more people, 48,000 more added to Detroit's population, that's new markets for investors. That's new markets for retailers, new markets for banks. That changes the way mayors make decisions about economic development. Thank you so much for your response. Let me thank this panel for their responses. Uh, thank um, my colleagues as well as the staff for their indulgence on this hearing. And as you heard, the bells were ringing. So uh, that will conclude this hearing. Uh, I'm sure there will be subsequent hearings. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah.